policy, please bring your hard questions. We're not going to dodge any questions tonight. Before we get into questions, though, I want to give you guys a little bit of a background about me. That way you know where I'm coming from, you know what experiences I have, um, and you've got a good idea of just who I am as a person. So I was born and raised in Rochester, New York. That's where I still live today. I am an upstate guy. I love upstate. I love New York State. Um, if I didn't, I wouldn't still live in New York. I would not. And to that point, how many people here know somebody who has talked about leaving New York State or has left New York State? Hands up, all over, almost every single person in here. How many of you guys are thinking, maybe you're going to leave New York State? Almost as many hands. Yeah, absolutely. So my story goes along the lines of this. For me, I was never politically active. I wasn't. I started a small business in Rochester. You would think that starting a small business and being having all the regulations that New York State puts on small businesses, that I would get politically active. I didn't, because all around, that's all I knew. Once again, born and raised here in New York State. All I knew was our strict, oppressive regulations. Then I bought my first house. You would think that the crazy amount of taxes that we pay would have woken me up to like, hey, this is wrong. Well, I lived in the city of Rochester, and people said, well, the city's taxes are way cheaper than the suburbs. And when I looked, that was true. So I said, oh, OK, maybe taxes aren't so bad, having no idea what they look like across the rest of the nation. Well, in 2013, Governor Cuomo passed a law that crossed my line in the sand. See, I grew up in Rochester, but I hunted in the southern tier. It was a big part of my family's upbringing. My grandfather was a World War II veteran. My father was an outdoorsman. I grew up hunting. And when the SAFE Act passed, I couldn't help but feel that my rights were violated. That was my line in the sand. Now, for every person, that issue might be different. It might not be SAFE Act for you. It could be the property taxes. It could be the business regulations. But that was my time where I realized I wasn't even registered to vote yet. That's what I realized. I wasn't even registered to vote yet. And somebody who I didn't vote for, who I didn't elect, made a decision for me that I was unhappy with. So I got registered to vote. That was step one. I got involved in local politics. I started realizing, oh, wow, the property taxes on my house are really high, really high. My aunt from Georgia kind of pointing and laughing, like, ah, you know because their taxes are so much less. I started realizing how bad our business environment was. And so what I did is I started traveling the state, encouraging people to register to vote, educating voters on the importance of participating in elections. That was my activism then. About two years ago, something changed for me in my life. I got married. I started planning for a family. And up until that point, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't something I was thinking about. So my wife and I get married. What we start planning for? We start planning for kids. And every single person who heard that, didn't matter if they were a friend, didn't matter if they were a family member, or even people that didn't even know me, they all said the same thing. They said, oh, you're having kids? Wow, that, that's great. When are you leaving New York? I was like, when am I leaving New York? What do you mean? This is my home. I, I love New York. I love hiking in the Adirondacks. I love going to Naples Grape Festival, the Apple Festivals, the Pumpkin Festivals, having four seasons. We have an amazing fall here in New York. And for those of you who like skiing and snowboarding, I'm really bad at it, but I still enjoy the snow. So it was never really a thought. And then I started realizing, wow, and I looked into our education system. Who knows what we're ranked at right now for graduation rates in our K through 12 system? 39th. 39th for graduation rates in our K through 12 system, yet we pay $10,000 more than the national average per student per year. 
I heard that number, I was like, wow, do I want my kids in that school system? 39th in the nation? That doesn't sound good. Then I looked at our taxes. Oh, geez. We trade back and forth on first and second place for tax burden in New York. So what does that mean? That means I got to work really, really hard, really long hours to make the same amount as somebody else, spend less time with my kids, and pay more for an education that's ranked 39th in the nation? And that doesn't sound great. Cato ranked us 50th for freedom. Man, that doesn't sound good either. And you look at thing after thing. We're ranked 40th for business. 40th. I'm a small business owner. I'm a small business owner. 40th for business? I have to think about the opportunity for my family in the future. So as my wife and I are looking at this, we realize, wow, New York, New York needs some help. Maybe, uh, maybe we should start looking somewhere else. So, and to that point, she literally went and we started looking at school districts in South Carolina. We started looking at property in South Carolina. You know what we found? Oh, we found some good school districts. We found taxes that we could afford. But you know what else we found ourselves doing? We found ourselves looking for a place that was close to an airport that had flights back to New York. And we started shopping for a house based on how easily we could get back to the place that we really call home. And once we realized that that's what we were doing, we realized that this is home. New York State is home, and it's worth fighting for. So that's why I'm here today. I'm here today because New York State is home and it's worth fighting for. And I hope that as you guys hear Larry and I's answers to your questions, you ask yourself if you agree with us that we can fight and make a difference here in New York. And is New York worth fighting for to you too? So that's just a little bit about me. Um, I mentioned I'm a small business owner, also a former volunteer EMT. And uh, that, that's my story. I want to make New York State a place that families don't run away from. I want when families are deciding to grow in other states for them to go, you know who's got really good education? You know who's got really good taxes? New York State. That's what I want. To get there, it's going to be a lot of hard work. We've got some plans to do it. And I'm going to bring up Larry here and let Larry uh, talk a little bit about himself too. So thank you guys very much. technology guys thank you <clears throat> so most of you know I'm Larry Sharp right yeah, yeah. Good. All right. yes thank you good Just making sure. sure we do all right so some of you are thinking Larry I'm glad that you're here I like what you're saying I think your ideas are, are nice and interesting but you're also saying to yourself well, Larry I hear some criticisms about you I hear some bad stuff too and one of the bad things I hear all the time I hear a couple of them the first one I hear is Larry, sounds amazing, but you can't win. No way you're gonna win. Can't win, wasted my time, can't win. Let's be very clear about something. They thought the same thing about Jesse Ventura in Minnesota. They thought the same thing about Barack Obama. They said the same thing about Donald Trump. They said the same thing about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. All of them said exactly the same thing. And every one of those guys won. Everyone won. So that's step one. But more importantly, which you may or may not realize, this has been an anti-establishment environment since 2016. The anti-establishment keeps winning. You know the people I'm running against? The Republican and Democrat? Literally, and when I say literally, they are literally career politicians. They've only known politics since they've been 18 years old. That's it, nothing else. And we wonder, wait a minute, how come they don't have new ideas? How could they? They can't drain the swamp, they live in a swamp. Right? You're asking them to burn down their own home. It's impossible. So this is, I'm the only guy who's anti-establishment. Huh. But there's more. This is a five-way race. In a five-way race in New York State, 30 to 35% can actually win this thing. Yes, 30 to 35% can win.
can actually win this thing. This is a winnable race. Every time you see a pole with me in it, which is a hard thing to find sometimes, but if you find a pole with me actually in it, you always find something. When it comes to people who know who I am, I always poll over 25%. Just know who I am and I poll over 25%, which means I only have to do two things. Name recognition, gain five points, I win this thing. That's doable. That's doable. Jesse Ventura at this time was pulling at about 10%. I'm pulling at 13. This is a winnable race. I'm still not done. Most important piece here. When you look at Barack Obama in 2018, when you look at uh, Donald Trump in, 20, in 2016, both of them were using the newest technology. 2008, it was email. That was a big deal 10 years ago. Raising money through email, sending out emails, the big deal. And that was way ahead of his, of, of, of his um, competitors. And then what was Trump doing? Twitter. He was tweeting all day long. That was a new thing, right? It was a cool thing. What am I doing? Podcasts and Facebook. Let me ask you, how many of you heard of me or saw me on a podcast? Yep, look at that. Um, when's the last time you saw Cuomo on a podcast? <laughs> Thank you, exactly right. He doesn't even know what it is. Correct, he doesn't even know what it is, yes. You're not gonna see a Republican on one either. You're not gonna see him on one either. It doesn't happen, but you'll see it here, right? How many of you uh, who came here today, how many of you actually saw one of my TV commercials on TV? Yeah, nobody, aren't any. That's the reason why. Yet you're all here. Somehow you're all here, right? Somehow all of you are here. Let me ask you something else. How many people in this room are, are comfortable telling me, with a show of hands, that you are a registered Democrat? Okay, good. Any registered Republicans? Anybody registered neither of those two? Great. Anybody who has not uh, voted in the past two election cycles? Bingo. There we go. Every single time I ask those four questions and I get all four of those people. Every time. Find a Cuomo rally that, oh no, you can't find a Cuomo rally. I'm sorry. Find a Republican rally that can make that happen. You can't. You want to win this thing? You've got to get Democrats, you've got to get Republicans, Independents, and those who don't vote. You saw it right in this room, all four. And if you watch any of my stuff online, I do it all the time. I ask the same four questions, and I always get, boom, 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 all three. And I get Democrats in red districts, and I get Republicans in blue districts. Yeah, I get Democrats in North Country, and I get Republicans in the Bronx. Yeah, I do. If you're going to make it up, check my live stream. I just did one in the Bronx, and, and I got Republicans. I did one in North Country after that, and I got Democrats. It doesn't even matter where I'm going. The reddest districts, I get Democrats. The bluest districts, I get Republicans. It doesn't matter. Why? Because what I'm saying actually matters. I am the only candidate that's actually saying something. What am I saying? I'm giving you actual plans. Actual plans, actual ideas. Let me give you, if I could, real fast, um, Governor, I'm sorry, King Andrew, uh, Cuomo II, if I, can pro if I can give you his entire campaign right now. Ready? We hate Trump. Done. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's a part of it. But his number one thing is we hate Trump. That's it. We hate Trump. That's, my entire, that's his entire campaign. How about the Republican? Cuomo's corrupt. It's the entire campaign. In both of those issues, I'll ask you an important question. How does that help any of you? How do either of those issues help anybody in this room? They don't. It doesn't make anybody's kid a better opportunity, better education. It doesn't give you a better opportunity, or give you a better job, or make your business more successful, or make your career more successful, or lower your taxes, or bring your friends or families back from North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, wherever they've gone. Or it doesn't stop you from wanting to leave. It doesn't give you a vacation. It doesn't do anything that makes your life better. Why in the world would we reward that behavior? It's a very important question. For the past 16 years, Democrats have run this state. 16 years they've run it. What does that mean? There has not been a Republican who won a statewide election in 16 years. Not governor, lieutenant governor, controller, senator, nothing. AG, zero, nothing. 16 years, nothing. So Democrats have run this state for 16 years. All the problems and issues that are happening are because of them. Without question, they ran a state, right? Andrew even said it, people leaving. Over 100,000 people leave New York State every single year. Over a million since His Majesty has taken the throne. Over a million, gone. But Republicans have been watching it for 16 years. 
So I ask you an important question. Where's their plan? Where's their movement? Nowhere. Nowhere. The second criticism I get all the time is, Larry, I can't vote for you because I'm a Republican, and if I vote for you, then I split the vote because my guy could win. Stop. <laughs> Just stop. 16 years he hasn't, he, he hasn't won, and this is the time he's going to win? Now is the year? Now is the year? Astorino had fire in his belly and raised three times as much money, and he couldn't win. And this guy's going to win? Please. Half of you in this room heard of me before you heard of him. Yes. I don't know. Guarantee. Half of this room, at least, if not more, half of this room heard of me before you heard of him. Some of you still don't even know who he is. Yep. That's correct. Some still don't. That's why I don't say his name. Because if I say his name, I'm giving him more than he actually deserves. That's why I don't say his name. If you notice, I never say his name. Because I know that. You, you don't even know who he is. You know me, you don't know him. And he's going to win? Guys, please stop. But if you're a Democrat, if you're a Democrat, I'll ask you something to think about. Why in the world would you accept the behavior that His Majesty has done to all of us? Think about this. He won't even answer questions of the press, much less debate or answer any questions of you. He won't even ask, answer any questions. He won't do that. Why? Because you are all peasants and he doesn't care. I'm not joking. You are all peasants and he doesn't care. But you, I'm a Republican. I'm a Republican. I'm Larry. I'm a Republican guy. Let me ask you a question. Where's his plan? I've been doing this for one year. I have a plan for almost everything and a movement. He's been in, in politics for 20 years. What's his excuse? His party's been watching this for 16 years. What's their excuse? If you're a Republican, you hear what he just said? He said, I'm going to reduce property taxes by 30%. You guys hear that one? That's his new one. Property by 30%. You believe that? You should be insulted by that. Because two things. One, either he just made it up, in which case, why 30%? Make it 100%. <laughs> I like that. 100%. He can say whatever he wants. He's not winning. It doesn't matter. He'll never have to implement it. It's irrelevant. <laughs> a million, 200%. I'm giving you money back. <laughs> Fine. Who cares? It's irrelevant what he says. But the worst part is, if this was real, why did he tell you this 30 days out of the election? Did he not see our pain five years ago, 10 years ago, three years ago? Did he not see our pain? Do you decide now he wants to? If this is a great plan, why didn't it come out two years ago, three years ago? I started this a year ago. Within 30 days, I had plans. Within six months, I had real policy. And now I have a, plan, a policy and plan for everything. People will tease me and say, Larry, where were you five years ago when we were doing this? Where were you 10 years ago when we were doing this? Where were you three years ago? I wasn't a public servant. I was fixing my business and fixing my family from the crash 2008, 2009. That's what I was doing. My job was to fix my own family. My job was to fix my own business. I did that. I did my job. Their job was to protect us. What'd they do? Failed. Nothing. If they had done their job, I wouldn't be up here. If they had done their job, I wouldn't be here. If we had a decent education system, we don't. If we had decent finances, we don't. If we didn't have a horrible tax burden, we do. If we actually supported the Second Amendment, we don't. If we supported small business, we don't. If we cared about helping people, we don't. I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have asked him to be my lieutenant governor. I wouldn't have done that. I have to run because they suck. <laughs> That's why. I have to run because they failed. Which is why Trump ran too. That's true. There we go. I ran because I don't want to leave my state. I don't want to move. Now, what do I focus on? I know I went a little bit off here, but I focus on something very important. If you see what I talk about, I focus on one idea, one concept, and that is happiness. Now, that sounds kind of crazy, sounds kind of cheesy, right? I get it. That's what I focus on. Why? Two reasons. One, this nation was built on three things, our founding documents, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Yeah, we seem to have forgotten that one. 
But no, it's a pursuit of happiness. How can I decide how you can pursue happiness? I can't. You should pursue happiness in any way that makes you happy. Sometimes, for some of us, pursuit is the part that makes us happy. And the governor protects us so we can keep on pursuing. Yes, this guy's good. I'm glad you're in front seat. Nicely done. Yes. <laughs> that, that is exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not supposed to be enforcing my will upon the people. I'm supposed to be defending your rights against the local bullies who will so often try to stop you from achieving your happiness. Like and mo weed does. Say again? Makes you happy. happy. Yes, that's fine. Be happy. <laughs> yes, 100%. Why do I care about happiness though at a local level? It's gonna sound crazy. Remember something, guys. I'm a business guy. That's who I am. I'm not, I'm not a politician, I'm a business guy. And what I know is, in business, everything you do, even though there are multiple things you do in any business, and if you own a business owner or if you run businesses, you know, there are tons of things you gotta work on. But at the end, it comes down to one thing. Happy customers. If you don't have happy customers, your business is going to fail. Right? Everything you do. It all comes back around to happy customers. Happy customers stay your customer. Happy customers tell others. Happy customers pay their bills. They're happy customers, that's great. Well, I wanna be the governor. I want happy customers. You are my customers. You are my customers. Because happy New Yorkers do several things. If you're happy, you know what you do? You stay in New York. You don't leave if you're happy. You build your family here in New York if you're happy. You build your business. You build your career. Your kids go to school here. They don't leave. They stay. And then when you retire, you stay here too. And when you get your pension, you spend it here too. And that's what I want. We have a big problem. I want you to imagine my, my perfect world. My perfect world is people are so happy here. They work for 20, 30, 40 years, whatever they like. They work here in a job or with a business that they enjoy and they like. They raise their children here. The children go to school here. They get jobs here. Then they retire, take their pension, and say, you know what, I like my pension. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna start a small business. Can you imagine how amazing this state would be if that was the norm? But it isn't. The norm is I struggle, I struggle, I struggle. My kids get educated and leave. Then I retire and I leave. That's the norm now. That's the wrong norm. I don't like that. There's no happiness there. And there's no people staying in New York. I focus on happiness. I focus on you all being happy. So you stay. So you stay. I'll ask, is there any other gubernatorial candidate who will tell you that? No. Not even part of their platform in any way, shape, or form. Not even their focus at all. Not at all. They worry about their own party politics or enforcing their will or keeping their people happy and when I say happy, just in ideology, not actually physically happy. They want them to be unhappy and afraid. Have you guys been watching the commercials recently? Oh my God. I saw one commercial, to give my example of not happy, I saw one commercial and it was basically this. I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit. John Smith is evil. John Smith hates you. John Smith is crooked. John Smith is corrupt. John Smith hates babies. John Smith wants to burn your house down. End. End. They didn't even say who to vote for. They didn't even say what the answer was. The commercial basically said, this guy really sucks. That was the commercial. That was the entire commercial. But what does that mean? That means the assumption is if I scare you enough, you'll do one or two things. Just give up and not show up, which they're very happy about. Or two, vote in fear for the other guy. That's it. What this campaign does, which you see, I hope you notice, is I don't focus on the negative. I do negative stuff too, everyone does. But I always focus then on the positive and the answer how we can make your life better. Because if we do well, and when I win this thing, I want you to understand something, when I win this thing, this is gonna change the entire nation. I'm not joking, there's no hyperbole here, no exaggeration here. It will change the entire nation. Because when I win this thing, it will tell every single person who wants to run third party, and libertarian, or any other third party, that you can have a chance, you can run, you can win, it can be done. You can run a campaign with actual ideas. You run a campaign talking to the people. You can run a campaign that actually has 
back and forth and as solutions, not just, not just the other guy's evil. You can do that. And when that happens, you will see the negative ads and the negative campaign begin to go away. Not because they care because they don't, but because it won't work. Because it won't work anymore. When it's just me and you, and I said, yeah, I know I killed two people, but he killed 10. <laughs> they still vote for me even though I killed two people. But when he's running too, yeah, I know I killed two people, but he killed 10. They go, but you're both murderers. I'm going to go vote for him. It will change everything in our country. It will shift what it means to be governed, to vote. It will all change. And you say, well, Larry, wow. How in the world are you gaining all these people? How are you gaining Democrats, Republicans? How are you making this change? How are you becoming that third party? Here's the most important piece to remember. As a libertarian, here's what I say. You can be as conservative or as liberal as you like. Just don't force yourself on others. That's the issue. Just don't force yourself on others. But Larry, I need the people in Manhattan to, love the safe, to, to hate the SAFE Act. No, you don't. You need them to not care. Seem to be apathetic. What else? Go ahead. Enjoy. Not, doesn't bother me. But I need, I need all the people you know, who, are, who are conservative to love weed. No, you don't. Just don't care. You want to smoke? Smoke. That's what I need. That can happen. You know how many times I hear people say, Larry, you know, I don't care about weed. I just want my guns. Deal! I don't care about guns. I want my weed. Deal! <laughs> We're in! Deal! This can be done. I often say, I'm not looking for you to agree with me 100%. I can't get that all of you, no, no way. But I can get 80%, and that's what I want. I go by the 80-20 rule. For those of you who know business, the 80-20 rule, for those of you who don't, you probably know politics. My first commander in chief was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan always said that if someone agrees with you 80% of the time, that person is your political ally, not your enemy. So I'm hoping that I get all of you in 80%. Because I don't want you anymore voting for the lesser of two evils. Remember, the lesser of two evils is still evil. It's still evil. If you get 80%, you should consider voting for me. If not, you should either stay home or vote for somebody else. But if I get you 80%, you should be like, you know what? 80%, I'm good. Now you have a reason to vote and get out and make things happen. This is a winnable race. This is about the future. This can be done. Let me cover a couple of ideas in general. The number one thing I'm trying to achieve, number one of everything, is I'm trying to decentralize our state. I want counties to be counties. I want regions to be regions. I don't want one city running the entire state. It's not fair to the state. It's not fair to the city. And we're all the same, which is good. You know, Andrew mentioned how much he loves this state. Yeah, I do too. I do too. So, and so are these guys, I can tell. <laughs> I am sure of that. You love this state, right? Yes, he does too. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So yes, I know that already. So I know that they love a state and so do I. But I don't just love New York City or just Rochester. I love everything about this state. I love the fact that I can, from a place like this, travel three or four hours and get to mountains as awesome as Colorado, farmland as amazing as the Midwest, an amazing waterfall, the largest city in the entire country. Uh, I can get to rivers, lakes, wherever I want I can get to. Loving that diversity means I have to also respect the diversity and know that North Country is not Southern Tier. It isn't. That Western New York is not Long Island. That Rochester is not New York City. They're different. And that's a good thing. We should respect that. And everything you'll hear me talk about, any question you ask me, every comment you make, I'll do, there'll be several things. One, it'll be focused on people being happy, not me being righteous. Righteousness is very low on my priorities. Happiness, really high in my priorities. Happy New Yorkers. You be righteous and you be happy. I'll just help you be happy. That's my job. That's what I'm going to do. Second, never, ever, 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 ever are you going to hear me raise taxes. Ever. I'm a libertarian. I hate taxes. Never going to happen. Everything I talk to you about, every plan that ever come, talks about the idea of getting better service without raising taxes. That's a critical aspect. You'll never hear that. What you hear Democrats say is, we have to fund or fully fund. What you hear Republicans say is, we have to invest in or support. What does that mean? Tax. Don't fool yourself. Taxes. Every time you hear that, that means taxes. 
Not what I'm talking about. I always have another way of raising those monies or saving, saving those monies. I'm not gonna increase your taxes ever. And the last thing, decentralize, localize, localize, localize. Focus on happiness, no new taxes, localize, <laughs> localize, localize. Everything I talk about is, is, is about those three things always. I want you to be able to control yourselves. I want you to care more about your local environment. I want you to have a happy environment because I want you in the long run to be a happy New Yorker and stay in New York. Now, there's a lot to do. As Andrew said, it's hard work, but we can do it. We can start by turning the state around and facing the right direction. I can't fix it overnight, but here's what I promise you. I can turn it the right direction. Yes, I can. I can put us in the right direction and get us marching in the right direction. I can do that. But Larry, how can you do that when the system is against you? It is. You're right. How can you do it when the press will be against you and the, and the, how, and the, and the Senate and the Assembly will be against you? You're right. Let me tell you how. Number one, the press. I love the press because when the press beats me up, it gives me the opportunity to educate. Every time, and if you see me do it, if you watch me do it in interviews and people try to get me in, dude, I got you, Larry Sharp. Nope, I educate them. Every time. Happy, can't wait for them to attack me. Attack me all day long. They attack me, I educate. If I educate, I turn people. And people start saying yes. Happy, let the press attack. Happy to take it, number one. Number two, the Senate. I will run the Senate 90 days. Why? The Senate is about 50-50 split in New York State. About 50-50. Once I win this thing, there's going to be at least seven or eight people who are liberty leaning, who are also gonna say, Larry, my friend, I've always loved you. You knew that. <laughs> of course, yeah, of course you do. Boom, six or seven turn libertarian. I had the swing vote, I now run the Senate. The Senate I have right away. So I'm happy with the press, I got the Senate. The problem is the assembly. That will be a challenge. Not impossible, but that's a challenge. And there are several ways to handle the assembly. Number one, as a business guy, some of you know what I've done in the business. In business. I've, helped business, I've helped businesses out. I'm the guy who comes in, helps to reorg, make things right, train, all those things. One of the things you learn is, when you're taking over a place that you're new and people see you as hostile, you don't walk in and go, let me tell you what to do, I'll tell you everything. You don't. You ask questions. You consult. And you let the local managers become local heroes. And when they begin to do that, they begin to support you. The first thing I will always do, and if you hear my, my policies, I'm never talking about cutting taxes, I'm talking about providing surpluses to the, local, to the, lo the localities so that they can create tax cuts themselves. Why? Then they can be local heroes. Let them put their names on it. I'll just sign it. Your bill, you're the man, you thought of it. You, oh, you, you're perfect, you, I'll sign it, you do it. When they start becoming local heroes, they're more apt to support me. But not just that, remember this. His Majesty runs this state with an iron fist. When I win this thing, there will be a power vacuum. And not just that, they will assume there will be a bloodbath. There will not be a bloodbath. It's not who I am. They're all vindictive. They all have to protect, they have to protect their careers. I don't, I don't have a career to protect. They have to pay back cronies. I don't have to pay back. I don't have any of that. There'll be no bloodbath for me. No bloodbath for me. It won't happen. When they see that, they go, oh, no bloodbath. Huh, better chance. But that's not enough either. There's more. As I said before, I need to grab that. No, okay, good, no, all oh, good, yeah. Well, it might be important, I don't know. Maybe you're a doctor or something, it's fine, whatever. So yes. So, but the, ne the next thing to remember here is, all right, I need you. You will be the ones who will be calling the assembly and telling them to help out. You will be the ones. As I've said before, many of you know I'm a Marine, I do not have a problem breaking a hole in the front line. I'll do it, I'll, I'll be the first in. I will go in, I will break a hole, and I will go in. But all of you have to follow me through. If you don't follow me through, I don't survive to the end. So when I go through, remember, I don't have a massive party, I don't have huge infrastructure, I don't have local county bosses, I don't have that stuff. I have you. If you follow me through, and you pressure them as I want you to, and you let them know what you wanted and why you voted, they will begin to turn. Not because they care about you, because most don't. But they do care about their own power, yes they do. And when they start doing that, things will begin to change. They'll have to shift, they simply will have to. I've actually made a uh, commitment already. We're gonna sell one of His Majesty's helicopters. Here's a couple. We'll sell one. We'll buy a bus. No, you, no taxpayer for you. We sell the helicopter to buy the bus, right? No tax money, right, to buy the bus. 
And then Andrew, who was an amazing tech guru, by the way, he's a tech entrepreneur, he's going to deck the, buck out, the, the bus out so that we can run the government in the bus. Why? So I can still keep driving around the state. So I can stay connected because I have to stay connected. If I don't stay connected, I will lose you and I will lose. Right? Winning in three and a half weeks is not the end of the war. It's the beginning. It's the beginning. We we'll just keep fighting. You're not off the hook that fast. You think you vote, you go home? No. You vote, you go home for a little bit, then I'm on the phone again with you. And we keep moving. We have a lot of stuff to do. This state has taken decades to break. We've only got, a, we've only got four years to fix it. So we have to definitely get, out, get, get, out, get up and start running to make that happen. Guys, if we do this right, we can actually move the assembly. But let's say I'm totally wrong. I am totally wrong and the assembly is going to fight me tooth and nail to death. No worries. If the assembly is going to keep me blocked completely, okay, I'll be bored, right? They don't want me bored. Because if I'm bored, I will then find the top two or three guys or gals who are in the assembly trying to be big shots, and I will simply take my entire team, we'll go to their districts, and we'll campaign against them. They'll lose their seats. Why? I'm good at this. You keep me bored? I'll sit in your, I'll sit in your district until you're gone. <laughs> That's what I'll do. I'll sit in your district until you're gone. With your bus. With my bus. That's exactly right. Yes, with my bus until they're gone. Until they're gone. They will realize it's not good to have Governor Sharp board. We should have him go do something. Yeah, you should. <laughs> it's a good idea. So whatever it takes. Prison justice, right? Hit the, hit the guy with the, the biggest guy, drop him. That's what it is, yes. So yes, I'm okay with that. I don't mind, that's what I'll do. What I'm telling you is we can change this. If we think right and we change the way we act, we turn this state into the right, in the right, in the right, into the right direction so we can fix this place. We do it by voting. We do it by November 6th getting out there and making sure you and your friends vote 2016 Sharp Hollister for governor. If we do that, here's what I promise you, one or two things will happen. Number one, we'll win. And if we win, we start changing automatically. What if we don't win? No worries, we'll come in second. What happens if the Republican comes in second? Nothing. 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 Zero. He goes back to sleep and they think for four years what lie they're going to tell you four years from now. And they have probably some other lie they'll tell you in four years. Now we play the, whole same, the, whole, the same game, game again. But what happens if I come in second? Then what? Go ahead. We get our own line. I'm sorry? We get our own line. I don't care about that. We'll get to them no matter what. <laughs> we'll get to them no matter what. That's, that's one criticism people tell me. I say, Larry, you're doing this for, you're doing this so you can get a, a libertarian line. Uh, Gary Johnson got 175,000 votes in 2016, and he was in this state for five seconds. He walked in, he said, hi, I'm Gary, J and left. He didn't even finish the sun, and he still got 175,000 votes in 2016 because so many New Yorkers were so tired of voting for R's and D's, they had, had to even know who Gary Johnson is, and he, and, and he still got 175,000 votes. We need 50,000 votes to be a party in New York State. I could stop now, we'll get that. I could put a chimp in my place. <laughs> I could get it, dress a chimp up, put this jacket on the chimp, and I would still get 1,000 votes. That's done deal, that means nothing. What I'm saying is second place. I'm saying a million votes. I'm saying that, what would happen? A microphone goes in my face every single day. How'd you do it? How'd you do it? And what will I do? I will talk about the same things again and again and again. We still get change. We still get change. I'll talk about supporting small businesses. I'll talk about fa uh, father's rights. I'll talk about fixing family court. I'll talk about supporting farmers. I'll talk about new ideas for taxation. I'll talk about new ways of supporting new industries. I'll talk about revamping education. All the things that you like, I will talk about again and again and again, even if I come in second. Either way, we get it. And when I'm too tired, I'll, I'll drag him out again. <laughs> I'll drag him out again, and we'll still go. Win, lose, draw, doesn't matter. You want change? changes right here. 2016, I mean, 2018, you can do it here. Libertarian Party, Larry Sharp, Andrew Hollister. If you make that vote, we will have change. We can have a better New York, a happier New York. We can have a new New York. Thank you. So I want to let you know something.
Uh, feel free, you can ask any question, you can make any comment, it doesn't matter, whatever you like, there are no rules. If you noticed, what you'll never see from me is notes. I've been doing this for over a year, I never use notes ever, I just speak from the heart and I tell you what I think. Also, I will answer any question, even if I don't like it, I'll still answer it. Even if you don't like it, I'll still answer it. I don't pander, I will tell you things you don't want to hear and things you do want to hear. The issue is I hope we match 80% of the time. I'm going for the 80-20 rule. So I'll ask now, are there any questions or comments? Go ahead, please. I want to make sure everyone hears this. We have all of this about environmental changes and all this. I'm, I'm wondering if we're that stupid. Uh-oh. In 1941, Henry Ford had a car that was lighter than fiberglass and 10 times stronger than metal. Okay. Made out of hemp. Okay. It was a uh, negative carbon car. Mm -hmm. Why don't we have that now? Ah, that I love that. that. Yes. We can't have that now? Like Henry Ford could have it in 1941? It, it, uh, the idea that we don't have hemp is not a stupid idea. It's a financial issue, right? There are, there are big forces and big companies that it doesn't make any sense to have hemp, right? You, when you look in, in New York State, what we do very well, here's what we do very well, two things we do very well. Number one, anything new, hit with a stick. <laughs> We're really good at that. Something new, hit it with a stick, number one. So first off, we like the old guys with the old everything and the old man. that's step one. But step two, now there's some fear, right? So when we do actually create it, and we will, look, officially hemp actually is legal in New York State, if you guys know that. It is actually officially legal. And so is cannabis. Please go ahead, please go ahead. Yes, in that's correct. That it is officially legal. Has a derivative license to produce CBD oil. Yep. Which only six licenses have been issued in the entire goddamn state. You have hit my exact point. Why yes. Only six licenses. Thank you. Why can't everybody grow hemp? Why can't everybody make CBD oil? Yep. Why does it have to be a cartelized system? That was what I was going to say. Thank you. You answered. You, yes. That's the second piece, right? We do what we do next very well is. Make sure only big business and crony capitalists win in our state. We're very good with that. We are good. So again, hemp is officially legal, and so is cannabis, officially. But you've heard my stance on this, and it's a radical stance, but it's a bold stance, but it's the right stance. We should be regulating hemp and cannabis like onions. So you're yes? saying hemp is legal. It is legal officially. It's very but it's, regulated. It's so hard to actually get a license for it, a small farmer will never get it. A small farm will never get it. Cannabis too. You just, you just won't get it. Right? Not, unless maybe you donate $40,000 to a certain majesty, majesty. Maybe you will. Right? Maybe your cousin gets on a board and gives a couple contracts out. Then maybe you will. But unless you're that, you're not getting it. Which is why you guys hear me say it, but I mean it. Like onions. When I say like onions, I mean, let me ask you a question. If you're a farmer, do you require a special license to grow onions? No. No. So you can grow any way you want. If you want to squish your onions up and make onion oil, can you? Yes. I don't know why you would. But if you wanted to, <laughs> you could. I'm not a farmer. Is that a thing? Onion oil? Whatever. So anyway, you could if you wanted to. You can do whatever you want. You want to, you want to dry your onions out and, and, and make them into a, a paste or some. I don't care. You're a farmer. Enjoy. Like onions. I'm not joking. Because if we do it like onions, several things will happen. There are so many reasons. I'll go into hemp and cannabis now because you brought it up. All right, I want to make sure that we make hemp and cannabis regulated like onions and I keep them together. Number one reason is farmers. Number one reason. Our small farmers are struggling in New York State and no one has an answer. Are they even talking about it? Is anyone even mentioning? They're talking about it, but they're committing suicide. Yes, uh, that's the next piece. Yes, and they're committing suicide, right? His Majesty is watching farmers commit suicide. We have a 30% increase in suicide across the country these last couple years. New York, New York State just as bad as anyone else. And who's talking about this? The only thing we talk about sometimes is veterans, which I, I get that. But while veterans are important, I love my veterans, I'm a vet, non-veterans are important too. And farmers committing suicide is a big problem we have. And almost every farmer I know knows of someone who's committed suicide. Small farmers, that is. They all know this. We're doing nothing. I have an idea. How about we give them hope? And we hope several ways. Number one, hemp and cannabis. If you think you should grow hemp and cannabis, go. I don't know if you should. I'm not a farmer, but you do. If you're a farmer and you think you can grow hemp or cannabis, please do so. And I mean overnight. Just get what you need and start. When I'm governor, you can if it makes sense for you. But 
Let me go to farmers real fast and stand up for a little bit. It's not just that. We have to treat all small farmers like small businesses, and we don't. And I mean in every way, shape, or form. Small farmers get hammered on insurance because they, they pay insurance rates like a farm, not like a small business. They get hammered on workers' comp because they pay it like a farm, not like a small business. So they get hammered on that. But not just that, they can't get SBA loans. They can't get business loans. They get regular loans, which is terrible because all it does is lengthen their time and they hope for a better future, but there is no future. So now they struggle even longer. So by the time things go bad, they can't even get out from <laughs> underwater and they commit suicide. And the answer now becomes death. That becomes the answer. And that's shameful that this state is that way. Treat them like small businesses in every way, shape, or form. You then add that to hemp and cannabis, what have you just done? You just set up the environment for another craft industry. Craft hemp, hemp creek, hemp plastic, hemp rope, hemp cloth. That now, if you treat it like a small business, a farmer can get a small loan to start their own manufacturing site on their farm, and all of a sudden now, they're cranking out craft products. Well, will that work, Larry? Have you seen the beer industry in this state? <coughs> yeah, it's already happening. Coffee, beer, it's happening already. Now, I'm not a farmer, but my gut tells me New York State is not going to be able to easily compete with the massive super grows in California because they've been doing it for years and they're massive. But can we beat them in craft? Yes, we can. Because they don't have craft out there. They only have big business out there. All their stuff's a big business. They don't have a craft industry out there. It's terrible. They're killing their small farmers out there. I was literally at an event. It was at a uh, cannabis investment um, summit about three weeks ago in Manhattan. Hundreds of millions of dollars being invested. Hundreds of millions. Not taxpayer money. Not your money. Banker money. Not your money. Banker money. Hundreds of millions. Guess how much was going to New York State? Donut, zero, not one dollar. It was held in New York City because the bankers were in New York City. Not because the money was going there. The money was going out of the country or California, Colorado, Washington State, and all to massive grows. But and they invited me to speak. Why? I'm the only guy talking about hemp and cannabis. No one else is. So they invited me to speak. No one else came, only me. So I go there and I speak and I tell them this is the idea. And they're just like, wow, that's amazing. They all want to vote for me. Why? Because they see, and many of the bankers, they see, oh my God, and this is really how they see it. I can now invest in a small farm personally and make all the money myself. This is greed. But they're thinking that. Right now, they, they, right now these bankers go out and get a bunch from, from big, big donors or, or big banks. But now this guy makes a bunch of money. He can say, how much you need for your girl? $200,000? All right, I'm your partner now. He comes up. How do I you know that's true? That's happening in the beer industry. You see it now? It's already happening. I'm not making this up. This is happening already. People making those investments, partners getting together, dropping two, three hundred thousand dollars and making a new craft beer. Now we'll make with craft hemp. Not bad. Craft cannabis. Yeah. But this concept, it's not hemp and cannabis, will also help our dairy farmers. Our dairy farmers are being crushed in this state also. Who's talking about them? Nobody. They're also getting crushed. Again, suicide. No one's talking about them. Our farmers are so hurt that they are, that they are choosing death as their only escape. And what has His Majesty done? Nothing. His serfs are killing themselves and he does nothing. I won't stand by and let that happen. I won't. We even help our dairy farmers. Why? Because when they get these loans, guess what they'll do? Craft ice cream, craft cheese, craft yogurt. The same thing. They can do exactly the same thing. And here's the best part. When they do that, there'll be less milk on the market. If there's less milk on the market, the price for milk goes up. So if you don't want to be a craft distributor or craft brewer or maker, you don't have to be. You'll still get more money because the amount of milk on the market will go down. Either way you win. But I got one more piece to add, and that is, in Wyoming right now, they have a law that if you are a local farmer and you only sell inside Wyoming, you are immune from all federal regulatory bodies. We should copy that here. <coughs> copy that here. Why? Because now you want to start your new business. You want to sell local.
Buy local. But not just that. Let's add on top of that, why aren't dairy farmers selling raw milk? So stop. That's my point. Why? No more. If you want to sell raw milk, please sell raw milk. That's my entire point. If you don't want to buy it, don't buy it. Consumers should decide, not me. I'm not a farmer. I don't know if you should buy raw milk or not. I don't know if you should eat, drink raw milk or not. I don't know. I don't care. If you want it, drink it. As long as you're transparent. Not federal guidelines. Would you like my milk? If you want to buy the milk, buy the milk. If you don't, don't. That's the right answer. Do you want to help farmers out? I've just given you really serious ideas to help farmers out. We can help our farmers. And just talking about this, maybe we'll even think about farmers. We don't even think about them. So, I mean, have you seen anybody have, a, have an actual idea to help farmers? Anyone talking about it but me? Nobody. So it can be done. I know I went off topic a little bit, but I want to bring it back to, to, to continue with the hemp and the cannabis. In New York State, it's more farmland than any state in the country. Is that true? Yeah, most of the world. I didn't know that. There we go. So why aren't we using it? I completely agree. Yes, I'm in. Next piece. I'm going to stay on hemp and cannabis for a second. Hemp, of course, is good for our environment anyway. It's good for our environment, so awesome. I hope people grow hemp. But cannabis too. All right, why cannabis? <coughs> Something else. We have a bunch of people in this state who have chronic pain. A bunch. Have chronic, you have chronic pain? Yes, a bunch of people. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who have chronic pain. And right now they have three choices. Choice one, opioid. Yeah, you're feeling it right. I just say it. Yeah, 80% of all of our addicts in this horrible addiction problem that we have, 80% comes from a FDA-approved prescription pain opioid for pain. And then we use taxpayers' money to get the people off of it. Again. Yes, we do. So we create it, and then we pay to, to, make the, to try to fix the problem, and we can't fix the problem. That's right. So we pay to fix the problem, and we can't fix the problem. So let's not start it. How about that? But that's option one. Per option two, suffer. Because right now, you're afraid of it, so you don't do it. Or the doctors now are afraid to, to prescribe. Why? Because the rule is, now we're going to punish doctors, because that always works. Hit it with a stick. More people in jail, always the right answer, always helps. Horrible. Or last piece, which I hear all the time. People come to me and say, Larry, I really hope you make marijuana legal. And I say, why? I have to smoke it at night or else I can't go to sleep. But I don't know how to get it, so I have my son go buy it for me. I don't want my son going to jail. So option three, become a criminal. Shame on us for that. Shame on us for that. So maybe become an addict, suffer, or become a criminal. No, take a cannabis product. Edible, oil, smoke it. Whatever's your thing, I don't care. Not my issue. My goal, happy New Yorkers. Because if you have chronic pain, you know what you can't do? You can't be happy because you can't do things with your friends and family. And I want you to do things with your friends and family. Go ahead. So say cannabis becomes legalized in New York State. What then will happen to everybody who is in the prison system because of strictly cannabis I will cover that in a second, yes. Let me cover, can I, can I finish this piece and then cover that? Yes, please. please remind me to make sure I do cover that. Yes, I will cover that, yes. So I don't want you to have to do that. Guess what? Use cannabis product. But Larry, I don't have much money, and I have chronic pain. Great. I said regulate like onions. What does that mean? Grow in your backyard. Grow your medicine in your backyard. Fine. You shouldn't suffer because you can't make a lot of money. Right? That's unfair. Oh, I'm poor, so I have to suffer? No. You're poor? Grow in the backyard. Do it. Have a good life. Be happy. Spend time with your family and friends. Do stuff. If cannabis helps you, Awesome, let it help you, not my issue, enjoy. That's how I feel about cannabis and hemp, but I'm still not done. Also for business, because part of what you just said, there are people who are felons now, who have trouble getting jobs. Some of those people are literally dealing hemp, uh, um, um, weed right now, right? There's a massive black market for weed, right? If you don't know that, you're not paying attention, because there's a massive black market for weed. There's literally an app on a phone right now in Manhattan, you press a button, and you get an app, and a guy with a bicycle will drive and, and drop your weed off. That exists already. Yes, that exists already. Yes. So I don't want to overtax it, because if I overtax and overregulate, two things happen. Number one, big business wins, small business loses. Big tobacco or big pharma wins, small pharma loses. 
I don't accept that, but not just that. If I make it too high of a taxation, what will happen? Black market. That's what's happening now in California. Colorado is still black market. But if I don't tax a regulator that much, guess what? Your current dealer, the guy who's giving you weed now, all he does is apply for his LLC or apply for his, his business license and he keeps delivering weed. He doesn't shut his business down at all. He just starts paying taxes. Literally. That's a good thing. Because the other option is, now he has no job, now he's a felon, now he's going to do something worse. Now he's do something worse. How about instead, let him keep doing his job? He's obviously good at it. <laughs> let him keep doing his job. That will help people just in general. Nothing but good, good, good. This is a positive thing. It helps deal with our opioid crisis, but it's something else even. I'll keep going with that. Opioid crisis. Hemp and, hemp and, hemp and cannabis. You have a cannabis product, people will choose cannabis products and not choose opioids, which means you'll have less addicts coming in. That's a fact. The data's already in. Now, some people say, well, well it's, a, it's a gateway drug. It's a gateway drug when the dealer is in the black market and he has many drugs to sell you. But when it's a weed store and he's only got weed, there's no gateway drug. He only wants you to buy weed. That's in his store. That's all it is. There's no more gateway drug. It doesn't work that way. Instead, people will pick these drugs for pain medication instead of opioids and they won't get addicted. But those who are addicted, there are cannabis products that actually help to mitigate withdrawal symptoms. You have a better chance of getting off the drug. You have a better chance of getting off the drug. Does that make sense? Hope I covered that. Who, was it your question? I know it was long-winded, but did I cover it? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have a habit of being long-winded. Now, you brought up a, a question that was about... Prison system. Yes, prison system. We need huge reform in the prison system. We just do. It's bad. A lot of it's federal, sadly, which I can't touch all the federal. But I can touch state, absolutely, but I can't touch all the federal pieces. But I can talk about it, which will make it easier when it comes to federal. As a general rule, we have to make a lot of changes. Let me give you in and out, the whole piece. First of all, I'll talk to you about specifically people who are, had possession. You, no one should go to jail for having a plant in their pocket ever. It's immoral. It's wrong. It should never happen. Now, if you steal to get that plant, you should go to jail for stealing. But you should go to jail for stealing, period. I don't care why you didn't, right? If you hurt someone to get that plant, you should go to jail for hurting someone. I get it, but I don't care what it's for. So if you hurt someone or steal to get your plant, you should still go to jail. But you have it in your pocket, you should never go to jail for that. Never. There's a problem though, you're right. There are people right now in prison for that. I would love to release them all. I can't. Here's the reason why. It's unfair to them and unfair to us. Both. Why? There are people who are in prison now who weren't in any way, shape, or form violent. But they are now. Because we put them in prison for many years. They become violent. And some of them, when they're very young, they don't know what's happening in the world today. If I release them today, it's cruel. It's cruel for them and for us. We have to create a SEPS program. SEPS is Separations Program. It's similar to those who are in the military. If you're in the military, a veteran like myself, you would know that when you get out of the military, sadly to be, there's a very bad job of it. Um, a very bad job of it. But they have what's called a SEPS program. There's supposed to be a transition period for you from being a combat veteran into being, to getting into the actual uh, regular everyday civilian life. They clearly do a bad, bad job because 22 vets every day kill themselves. So obviously it's, it's failing miserably. But the concept is good. There should be a SEPS program. I will base that SEPS program on the program right now that's in, in uh, Massachusetts called the Humvee program. The Humvee program is a program that, that has people from different um, communities, in this case veterans, and it, the CEOs pick it. The two, two CEOs who are going to pick and choose the right people. They run it along with volunteers that come in. And over the course of time, they work people to get out back into the world. Now, the recidivism rate in right now in Massachusetts is about 75%. From this program, less than 5%. Massive difference. I will copy that program for all those people. And those who are not as violent and ready to go will come out sooner. And those who aren't will require more time. It isn't fair to put them out. And also, we don't have good jobs for us now who aren't in prison. And I'm going to put 2,000 more people out in the streets. They're going back to jail again. But this time for something worse. I don't want to do that. It's not fair. Did that answer your question? Yes, perfect. Yes, good. So yes, um, go ahead. So uh, just on a different subject. Any subject you like. Yeah, I'm a, I consider myself a 
Ron Paul Republican. Okay. I'm currently undecided. I do like you as a candidate. More. Well, you're undecided? <laughs> you're Ron Paul Republican and you're undecided. I am, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay, please. I need to hear this one. Go ahead, please. My issue with the Libertarian Party, specifically with the current appearance that Bill Well is going to be the 2020 presidential nominee, well, he supported the Iraq War. All right, you know I'm running for governor, right? No, I understand that. You know Bill Well's in Massachusetts, right? I understand that. Okay. That, but, okay. Uh, you know, he signed a letter supporting the Patriot Act. He even called AR-15 weapons of mass destruction during the 2016 campaign. My concern is that if I support you, I might end up enabling a gun-grabbing neoconservative in the 2020. So my question is, will you pledge to not run on a ticket with Bill Wells in 2020? If the answer is yes, no follow-up. If the answer is no, how could you uh, attack Mark Molinaro for having an anti-gun running date when it seems that you would be willing to do the same thing in that case? Okay. Two, two things. Wow. You, you pulled that completely out of your ass. But that's fine. No worries. Um, number one, um, do you know what your alternative is? Let's say that I right now said, I love him and I want to run and everything is awesome. You have two choices. Me or nothing. Be very clear. You want to, if you want to compare me against perfection, I lose every time. Good luck with King Cuomo round three. Period. The other option is nothing. So you should instead be, mark, you should be judging me against status quo. Here's your, to be very clear with you, here's your other option. You can vote R or D, you can be righteous. I'm a Republican, I'm a vote for my guy. That's what I vote for. Awesome, he's gonna lose. Cuomo comes in first. You can be righteous as you're packing your U-Haul and going to North Carolina because this state's a disaster. Just keep that in mind. Every time someone wants to, uh, wants to say, but Larry, here's the one thing I don't like about you, whatever that thing is, right? Yeah, I'm not perfect. And you may find that you don't like about me. Again, I said 80-20 rule. So, but not just that. What's your alternative? Nothing. Does that make sense? Your alternative is nothing. Now, why do you care about me and Bill Well enabling them in 2020? Dude, what are you thinking? I'm being very, what are you thinking? Let's say I'm gonna, you're going to enable Bill Well for 2020. Let's say that's true. How does that help anyone in this room? How does that help you? It doesn't enable him. That's my whole problem. That's my whole question. Yes. So let, but let me end. What I'm trying to get at is you're trying to find something that has virtually no value. But it's okay. I'll tell you. I'm not going to run for president at all in 2020. I've said it more than once. What I'm not doing president? it. What? What about vice president? Mm, I, I, I might consider it depends. But I could. Maybe. Depends. That's my, that's really I my question. I could. My yes. question is, New Yorkers will see you with a form of credibility if you do well on the state. And I suspect you'll do better than any other libertarian candidate has. Mm -hmm. And you'll then be a very attractive option in 2020 for that candidate. Yes. Now, I'll just tell you in all candor, I believe Andrew Cuomo is almost certainly going to win this election. That's okay. just my particular opinion. Good. So, I tend to think that this is a question of whether to reward the Libertarian Party and... No, you shouldn't. You should vote Republican. I should vote Republican? You should. All right. Thank you. Yes. Anyone else? Question? Yes, go ahead. Did you, you already got one. I know. You should go. So to give him one. Go ahead. Uh, uh, what's your plan or... Uh, what, I'm not familiar with New York politics. I only moved here two years ago. I'm not quite sure how exactly... Yeah, works. please. Where'd you come from, by the way? Where'd you come from? Canada. Oh, wow. Thank you. you Thank you. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah, I married a local. Um, I love it. <laughs> so there are some very good-looking New Yorkers. That's true. <laughs> there are. It's very true. Um, so there's some really dumb, like, any state laws in New York. I'm sure some? Yeah, many. Many. Thank you. Yes. So I'm wondering, what, what can you do to repeal them? Like, how... how, how Yes, great question. Like, yep. for, for instance, I, I have a pickup truck with tinted windows. Yep. It's been tint, they've been tinted the whole time I've had the truck. And now you're years. evil. And now it's illegal. Yep. And now I have to find a dodgy inspection person to ignore that. Yep. <laughs> no, seriously. I, I looked up the history of this legislation. It's to keep New York cops happy so they can see yes. in your thing. That's the entire yes. reason. Let me. It. I yes. live in New York City. Why do I have to travel? <laughs> no, uh, look. For somebody in New York. 
I got you, let me tell you. Here's the number one issue. As I said, localization. I said that a million times, localization. We have to change the culture of this state, right? Right now, the culture is, if I win, I enforce my will upon you, right? Elections have consequences. I don't want that. What I want is, I win, now I protect your rights against the local bullies. And it's almost always local bullies who decide these things, right? I protect you against those. I will actually have an office of transparency. Nice word with the tinted thing. I'll have an office of transparency, <laughs> right? And that will allow you that when you have th things like that to go to my office and say, hey, why do we have this law? Why is this happening? I've already talked about that law specifically, by the way. And I've taught the cops about it. And here's what they want. And here's what I want. Very simple. If you have tinted windows and you get pulled over, it, the law will be, you must roll down your window. I'm not joking. Yes. That's why it's a nice, it's a nice law. The ro law is, you must roll down your window. That's it. Tint as much as you like, as long as you can see out, obviously, right? Because that's safety that will hurt others if you can't see out. Otherwise, roll your window down. This is the kind of things will change. But we can't change without a culture of this. And the idea of localizing, deciding that the governor doesn't know everything, you constantly hear me say things like that, right? I don't know what's right for a farmer. I'm not a farmer. I don't know what's right for tinted windows. My windows aren't tinted. I don't have to know. All I know is, are you hurting somebody else? You're not? I'm good. Are you going to make cops afraid and want to shoot? That's a problem. Roll your window down. Does I that make that, sense? I get that. One more question. Is there a mechanism for the governor's office, if you win, to initiate repealing or altering those laws? 100%. As I just said, it, we're actually going to have three, three offices. Office of the repeal, office of the pardon, office of the transparency. Yes, all three. Yes, 100%. All three. Awesome. Thank you. Did I, did I answer your question? Good. Let me get over. I'll, let me, I'll go back to you now. What's up? Oh my God, yes. K through 12 is a huge disservice to anybody who decides they don't want to go to college. I never went to college to do my taxes. I don't know about, about getting a mortgage. I never knew how to balance a checkbook. I figure all that out by myself. And Probably the hard way. A lot of people who ended up in thousands of dollars of credit card debt yep. in the 20s because they didn't know any better. Absolutely. Yes, common problem. I agree completely. Is it okay if I go through my education plan, guys? Okay, let me go through it real fast if I could. Well, it doesn't go through fast, but anyway, I go through it. All right, so yes, I want a complete and total revamp of the education system. Total revamp of the system. Absolutely. Number one, no standardized testing before high school. All goes away. Standardized testing is an unfair way of grading teachers. It's an unfair way of rewarding schools. It, it makes kids who are 10, 11, 12 years old who don't, who don't test well feel stupid. It creates a second class of, of student. And here's the worst part, it doesn't actually have any indication of success in life at that age at all. It needs to go away. There's a problem with that though. While I'm happy about that, and the vast majority of teachers are super happy about that, the federal government won't be. The federal government wants that. Two things will happen. Number one, we'll lose Common Core. So what? It's going away anyway. It's a disaster. Everyone knows it's a disaster. It'll go away. Who cares? I'm actually not against Common Core. I say this often. There's a nuance here. I'm against the mandate that forces teachers to use it. There's a small percentage of kids who actually will learn better on Common Core. It's a very small percentage. If you happen to have that kid in your class, and you're a teacher, feel free to use that tool. Common Core should be another tool that teachers can use. I am the only candidate who actually says, let teachers teach, then I let them teach. I don't add administrators, right? The next thing will happen. We will lose federal funding. The, um, the, our budget is about $60 billion, give or take. We will lose $4 billion from the federal government. That's what we will lose. So, oh my God, $4 billion. Okay, hold on, keep that number in your head. $4 billion bucks we lose. But what, what do we also lose? All the strings attached to that money, which means a whole lot of administrators, people who do grant writing, people who make sure boxes are checked, people who check this box, check that box. You know, our burnout rate in teachers is huge. Anybody in education knows this? Yes, yeah, so you know it, huge burnout. And what is it? Check box, check box, check box, check box, admin, admin, admin. They hate it, they want to leave, right? The best teachers want to leave. Good teachers become apathetic. Apathetic teachers become bad. Bad teachers become disasters. It's a bad environment. We want to change that environment. So we'll, we'll lose all those administrators. Think about that. The average teacher in New York State makes about $80,000 a year as an average. The average administrator makes over one hundred fifty. 
Some make two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah, you get rid of two administrators, it's three teachers plus raises. Three teachers plus raises. I'm creating a surplus right away in every school district. But I did lose four, bu four billion bucks though. All right, I'm not dumb. K through 12 itself is an anachronism and shouldn't exist anymore. It should be K through 10. Not K through 12, K through 10. And there are countries that already do this. In fact, it's already happening in New York City. People don't tell you because the wealthy get it. K through 10. The last two years of high school for too many kids in this, in this state are weed, video games, yes, study hall and gym. Yes, everyone's going, yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's the norm. That's the norm. Yes. Yes, you know that. Yes. So what does that mean? The, the results you find is now kids go to, go to college, they're not ready. How do you know? It's 13th grade. The, the first year of college is 13th grade. And the average kid now takes over six years to graduate if they even graduate. If they even graduate. So now you got a kid who goes to college, doesn't want to go to college, but goes because everyone forces them and tells them the lie you keep hearing, which is, the only way to success is to get an amazing Regents New York State Diploma, which means nothing. Be very forward. The Regents Diploma we have in New York State is worthless. It has no value whatsoever. It is a horrible waste of time and energy. It should have gone away years ago. I know. I work. I have an actual, I hire and fire. I run a business. Never has anybody said, Regents Diploma, whoa, you're hired. <laughs> Never happened. Never happened once. Ever. Totally useless. Has no value whatsoever. Nobody cares. So when we lose that good, nobody cares. So now the mental life, you have to get a Regents Diploma, right? And you have to go to college, you get a great four-year degree, and you'll get an amazing job behind a computer, make a million dollars. Yeah, that's a lie. That's been a lie for decades. It's a lie. That is a way to success, but not the only way. For some people, it's exactly the right answer, but not for all. Why are we pushing kids through this? Now the kid's 24 years old, never had a job, and, and we wonder, why do they have no work ethic? Huh. Or they're 24, they have a degree in something that has no value, there's no jobs for them, they're $100,000 in debt, and have to work at Starbucks. They do that for two, three, four years, then they're 24, 25, 26, 28, 29, they have to go back home to work with mom and dad, go back home with mom and dad because they can't make the money to pay their debts. We have that happening all over the place. And go, mom, I just want to build houses. And then they go into the trades. Then they go into the trades. Why didn't they go? We got BOCES because our culture has said BOCES is for the bad kids or the dumb kids. Shame on us as a state that that's how we are. Shame on us. Shame on us for forcing that. It's not true. Trades are just as good as anything else. STEM is amazing. BOSIS is amazing. They're all good. You know what's good? What makes you happy? That's the right answer. The right answer is what makes you happy. And if BOSIS makes you happy, you should be going to BOSIS because it makes you happy. So it should be happening. Because the kid who goes to BOSIS, he's 24 years old. He's making at least 80K a year. At least. At least 80K at a least. year. Yes. Yep. At least. And he has no debt. That's the real smart kid. That's the real smart kid. And it's the worst part. This state needs tradesmen desperately. You know how many people I hear say, Larry, I would grow my business, but I can't find anybody. I can't find anybody. All the time. Try to find a plumber. Yes. Right here. Yes, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 You can't find them. It's hard to do that, right? The average tradesman in this state is 50. I like my 50 year olds, I'm 50. I like being 50, it's good. But I don't want that to be the average. The average should be 30, 35 should be average. But it's not, we should be, we should incur be encouraging trades. So what's the actual answer? Let me give you the actual answer. At, once you got K through 10, now we fix it. Here we do, here we go. Five choices for a 16 year old. Choice number one, you think college is the right answer for you. Awesome, two year prep school. <laughs> Two-year prep school will get you set ready for the right college. So when you get to college, you are ready to rock and roll. You're, you're going to have a history or, or biology or whatever is the thing you want to do. I don't care. Philosophy, business, law, medicine, whatever. Go to, say again? If you want that, I'm okay with that too. <laughs> Up to you, right? But again, I'm, I'm, I'm about happiness. If that's your thing, do it. But now when you get to college, 
you are ready to rock and roll. You spent two years in the prep school, you know what you're in for, you know what works, what doesn't work, and when you get in there, you probably graduate in three years, take advantage of internships, incubators, get out and really have a chance at working in whatever field you wanna work in. Awesome, option one. Option two, you're that super smart kid. You're that book smart kid, right, who spends all his time watching Doctor Who. Anyway, yeah, I'm teasing, I like Doctor Who too. Yes, I do too. Anyway, yes, but you're that, you're, that, you're that book smart kid who take SATs and tests very well. All good. Take your SAT now, go right to college. At 16, get a two-year degree. Go get an associate's degree. Now you're 18, finish off your college at 18. Life is good. You're gonna be a scientist anyway. You're gonna spend 10 years in college anyway. Start now. Why should you be bored in high school when you're that kid who can, who can, take, who can start building rockets already? Go start building them. Go do it. Third option. You don't like internet stuff. Go to trade school. Become a plumber, become a carpenter, become a mechanic, become whatever's appropriate. Go do it, I don't mind. Do what you wanna do. Two year trade school. When you're 18, you have one of two things. Either a license, if appropriate, or an apprenticeship, depending upon what you're doing, obviously, right? But either one, you have it. You're ready to rock and roll at 18 and start working. Next, go to work. Yes, you're 16, go to work. I worked at 16, go to work. Learn what it means to have a work ethic. Learn what it means when your boss tells you be here at eight, that doesn't mean 9.30. That means 7.45, right? Understand that be here 8 a.m. doesn't mean I thought you meant early, yeah. right? How many times I've heard people tell me, Larry, I will hire anybody with a work ethic? You know, yes. There's guys who tell me, I'll tell them to show up at eight. If I open a door at eight and he's there, he's hired because I can't get people to show up at eight. So showing up, you're hired. That's it. Yes, you, you open the door at eight o'clock, he's there, son, he's hired. That's it. That's how bad it is. Learn a work ethic now. The last one, start a business. Now people tell me two things. Number one, Larry, they're young, they're 16. Yeah, good. Make your mistakes at 16, do it. The price for failure at 16 is nothing compared to the price for failure at 26. Nothing, nothing. And if you're 16 and you're failing, you go back home to mom. Go back home to dad. You live at home anyway. You can work for a lower rate. Maybe you'll start working on a farm, see if you like it. You'll work in trades, you can test and see if you like it. You'll learn things. It's good. How are you gonna pay for it? Here's how. I was a Marine. When I got out, I got a GI Bill. They gave me X dollars and Y number of years to use it. Right? Same thing. Every kid gets the same thing. They get the education bill, whatever you call it. Kids education, the KE bill, I made that up. They got the KE bill, made that up. So yes, which is $20,000 and seven years to use it. So you get 20K, seven years. Good luck. Here's what I promise you. A bunch of trade tools are gonna pop up. And those trade tools for two years, guess how much they're gonna cost? $20,000. $20,000, it right, yes. Of course they are. A bunch of prep schools gonna pop up. Guess how much they're gonna cost? $20,000, yes they will, of course they will. They're gonna pop up all over the place, of course they will, they'll pop up. How do I know that? Because they'll get loans. How do I know that? It's guaranteed government money. Of course you get loans for that. Bankers drool over that. Guaranteed money? Here's your check, they can't wait. Of course they'll do it, all the time. Now, you might say, well Larry, that sounds great, but $20,000, why are we paying for it? Because the Constitution says we have to pay for all education grades one through 12. So we pay for it, it's there. But here's the best part. Right now we pay $22,000 per kid per year. With this plan, the last two years, we pay $10,000 <laughs> per kid per year. We save $12,000 per year. There's about 400,000 11th, 12th graders in New York State. <gasps> That's over $4 billion, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. That's over $4 billion. Yes, it is. Federal funds are gone and I don't care. Federal, we, have, we make more up in savings, and on top of it, all those administrators, gone. Which means you've just given a massive surplus to every, you've given a massive surplus to every single school district and provided more value and provided happier teachers and happier students. Now and, I, won't, what? I won't vote for you now because you're gonna, I'm gonna get fired. Why are you getting fired? School administrator. Yeah, they won't vote for you, you're right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they won't. Now, but here's the issue with school administrators, we, we fall with you. School administrators, I'm not firing them. The local school district will decide what's right for them. And, I, and you do need administrators. You need administrators. Of course you do. You don't need as many. There are districts now that have more administrators than teachers. That's true. 
more administrators than teachers. That shouldn't exist. What will they do? They'll pick the best administrators and keep them. And I'm sure you're an amazing administrator, so you keep your job. There we go, yes. But if you're not a good administrator, then you don't get to keep your job. That's how that works. So, but there's something else about this. Something else to remember, if you're a teacher, think about this, you're a teacher. How amazing would it be if you're an 11th and 12th grade teacher where every kid wants to be in your class? Changes everything. You're a student, 11th and 12th grade. Everybody in your class wants to be there. Imagine the difference in how that is for you personally and for the teacher. This actually makes happier kids. It makes happier kids. Now I ship this into school safety now. Why? Because people talk about school safety. Guns aren't killing our kids. Three things are killing our kids. Lack of community, lack of purpose, and loneliness. That's killing our kids. Everyone in these school shootings, while it is a murder, at its absolute core, it's a public suicide. When kids have purpose, when kids have community, they don't want to kill themselves or others. It is literally that simple. Happier kids makes for less violent kids. Happier kids makes for happier parents. Happier parents makes for happier teachers, which means happier New Yorkers. And that's my goal always, is happier New Yorkers. Everything I talk about are happier New Yorkers. You, that's my plan, that will fix a whole lot. Did I answer your question? Awesome, go ahead. Thank you. I believe you're gonna win this. All right, yes. I'm here, you're all I got. Thank you, my friend, thank you. I love it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What are you gonna do to make it so I'm not a felon when I'm carrying more than 10 rounds in my pistol all over the state? Yes, there's a couple of things. Yep. Yep. East of here? Yep. I'm gonna tell you right now. Um, I am the only candidate who is actually for all of your rights all the time. I'm the only candidate that supports all of the 10 amendments of the Bill of Rights to include the Second Amendment, which people seem to think that somehow is not valid. They're all valid. The Second Amendment is valid. The First Amendment is the number one event amendment for a reason. If we don't have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, freedom of the press, we don't have these things, we don't have a nation. So that's number one. And what's the second one? The one to protect the first. It's important, it matters. It matters, 100%. So a couple things. New York State's a very anti-two-way state, as you know. As you all know, who pay, if you pay attention, very anti-two-way state. And that's okay, we can fix it. It'll take some time. What I fight on constantly is SAFE Act. SAFE Act has to go. Why does it have to go? Number one, it made millions of, it made millions of New Yorkers criminals overnight. Overnight, someone who purchased their firearm legally, owned it legally, overnight, they were a criminal. Not just a criminal, they were a violent, Felon. Very clear. A violent felon is who they were. Overnight, because someone decided, well, I don't like this piece of plastic on someone's uh, weapon. Overnight, violent felon. We can change that. We have to. Right? So, not just that. It also decided that, you know what, it's going to make our, our um, medical personnel part of a secret state police. Am I exaggerating? Our medical personnel right now report if you have any kind of issue or problem mentally, anything. I feel bad. Is that suicidal? Yes, suicidal. Cops now come, take your firearms. Yeah, not just that. This affects our veterans more than non-veterans. By percentage, veterans are more apt to have PTSD and also more apt to own firearms. So it affects them more than others. And vets know each other. So we tell them these stories. Vets don't get help now. Because when they go and get diagnosed with PTSD, they lose their firearms. Why do I tell you this? Because when I tell people this who are actually pro-SAFE Act, they're shocked. The average person who's pro-SAFE Act thinks this far only. Well, it says SAFE Act, and we haven't had a shooting in five years, therefore it works. They're done. That's as far as they go. That's it. So I actually go and I say, oh, is that right? Did you know that it made people criminals overnight? They go, no, 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 no. It didn't outlaw machine guns. That's what I say. Yes, but they don't know that. You're right, and they don't know that. I had someone actually tell me that. Didn't that ban machine guns? Because in their mind, machine gun is the same thing as assault weapon. In their mind, it's the same. They don't get it. They ban machine guns, it's a good thing. Didn't ban machine guns. Not just that, it made a black market. A black market in ammunition, a black market in firearms. Yes, 
men in black market, making it harder for law enforcement to do their job. The SAFE Act is bad, bad, bad. Nothing but bad, it has to go away. The, now, how can we make that happen? I talked earlier about influence in the Assembly, influence in the Senate. This is how. When the press realizes what I'm going to do, you will find all of a sudden, I begin to educate. You will get a bunch of Democrats who, don't, who love the SAFE Act going, oh, that, that isn't fair. Yeah, SAFE Act can go away. And when Democrats become apathetic for the SAFE Act, the SAFE Act goes away. That's the number one thing we can get rid of SAFE Act. It can happen. By 2020, we'll get it repealed. I am the only candidate who is saying we will repeal the SAFE Act. The only one. No one else will say it. They will go, oh, well, we'll chip around the edges. We'll try. We will get the SAFE Act repealed by 2020. Go ahead. Go ahead. Like Texas style or just a little bit better than it is now? No, no, let me keep going. First one. Okay, First, no, no, I'm with you. Look, yeah. I would like it to go Texas style, but that's not going to happen overnight. I'm just being forward with you. I don't want to promise you something I can't deliver. So first thing is, by 2020, SAFE Act's gone. Right? I'll stop pardoning people who've been victims of SAFE Act. The uh, press will attack me all day long. I'll tell the cops it's your lowest priority. Press will attack me all day long. And as they attack me, I will educate, educate, educate. We'll make this happen. You will call and help me, as I mentioned earlier, to make this happen. Right? That will happen. But it's something else to do besides that. Get rid of SAFE Act. Plus, I will veto any red flag laws. You guys know what red flag laws are? Yeah. Red, yes, red flag laws. Are, the SAFE Act's one of them, but the new red flag laws are this. Okay, he's a teacher. And as a teacher, he has a kid next to him, and the kid happens to like an NBC TV show with a detective in it. So the kid draws a picture of the detective, and there's a gun. He's a detective. He draws a picture. The teacher goes, ooh, drawing a picture of a gun. Hmm. That's what happened to him. That could be a red flag right there. He goes to the judge. He goes, judge. You know, this kid's drawn, I'm not really sure. Judge doesn't know any better. Trust the teacher. Okay, yeah, red flag. Cops come, take my firearms. Yes, red flag. <clears throat> Something could happen. I will, I will veto all of those laws. If we don't stop on the SAFE Act, red flag laws are next. They're coming already. But next, I want to make sure we have, <coughs> excuse me, make sure we have universal transportation, uh, um, firearm transportation rules throughout the entire state. But right now we don't. Right now, if you take your legally owned firearm into New York City, you're going to jail. You're going to jail. It should be very simple. Two things. Number one, if your, if your firearm is locked and unloaded, you should take it any place in the state. That's the minimum. If counties want to be more lenient, they may. But no matter what, if it's locked and unloaded, done. It's fine. You're not going to jail. But there are two more parts of this. Number one, we have to have the definition of loaded. Sorry, usually Andrew does this piece all the time. I'm sorry. Is it okay if I take this piece? Okay, yeah. This is, this is Andrew's baby. I'm sorry. Yes. The, the locked and unloaded piece. Right now, the definition for loaded in New York State is ammunition in the vicinity of the weapon. So here, I, I got a box right here of ammunition and the firearms right there. That's loaded. We're going to change the definition to bullets in the gun. That's it. But I'm not even done. Yes, I know. Wow, it's crazy, right? Yes, it is crazy. One more thing, though. Right now, if you draw your firearm in an attempt to stop a crime, you're going to jail. So literally, she's trying to stab him. I vote, yes, yeah, she's a bad person. You messed up. She's bad. Yes, you messed up. Yes, so yes. So I draw my firearm and I say, stop, don't stab him. If she doesn't stab him, I go to jail. She doesn't. Brandishing. It's correct. Right? If she stabs him, we go together. <laughs> we'll sit in the back. She talk about how bad the gun laws are. As we're sitting in the cop car, heading off to jail. That's how that works. We're going to make it to where if you draw your firearm in an attempt to stop a crime, that should not be a prosecutable crime. Now, if you do something with that weapon that's illegal, that's different. Right? That's different. But the fact that you drew your weapon in an attempt to stop a crime should not be a crime. That I'll take care of in the first two to four years. That I promise you. That's what I'll do. Then we'll see what happens and we'll keep going forward. Did I ask your question? Yes, sir. Awesome. Good. Go ahead. All right, so me and my wife are from Rexit Transport. I'm not I agree with most of your platforms. Did I get you 80%? Yeah, you got me to make Yes. I'm winning. I'm winning. Um, so I come from a right to work state. Mm -hmm. And New York is heavily unionized. Yes, the most unionized in the entire, entire country. So what, yes. what, are, what is your view on that? Yes. No, no. Look, I, I think unions are part of the First Amendment. They are literally... They are literally, you know, freedom of speech plus freedom of association. At the same time, I'm very happy with the Janus decision, right? No one should be forced to be in union. 
<laughs> at all. And I think, the, I think the result of Janus plus unions will eventually, in the next five or ten years, equal better unions and maybe even more unions, meaning split up, right? Because right now they're monopolies, and monopolies are never good. Unions right now are not good because they're monopolies, right? And next thing is, you look at unions right now, and if you, any of the union workers here? Oh, good, so you'll, you'll agree with what I'm going to tell you. Unions spend 90% of their time, energy, and money on 10% of their worst workers, members. Right? 90%. It's true. Yes. 100%. Yes. 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 That should change. Janice will make that change. Now they're still spending 90% of their time on 90% of their actual workers, which is what they should be doing. Right? They should be representing all 90%, not just the 10. And they become very adversarial because of that. And it makes other union workers look bad. Other people who aren't union workers feel bad. Not a good idea. Janice is going to help. I think it's a good idea that Janice is, 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 is saying that you don't have to join a union. And unions are fine. I think collective bargaining is, is normal. It should be done. I don't have a problem with collective bargaining at all. Go ahead. It's more important how are you going to handle backlash? What backlash? I mean, the, the union backlash. If, if you were to become governor, okay. how are you going to handle the union? Unions backlash? don't like me already. That's what I'm saying. How yes, and that's, that's not going to change. But union workers love me. Yes. 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 Union workers love me. That's all. I don't care. I'm happy. Yes, I don't have a problem at all. The unions, the unions don't like me because they don't, they're, they're establishment. Right? They, they, all the establishment hates me. Establishment. Union hates me. Establishment. Uh, people hate me. Anyone who's established doesn't like me. I get it. I'm, I'm okay with that. I need 35% of the vote. 30% of the vote is all I need. Realizing that most New Yorkers aren't even going to vote. His Majesty won his last election with 11% of the popular, population. 11%. So I'm really okay. Remember, 60 to 70% of New Yorkers don't vote. Yes, 60 to 70% don't vote. So union execs don't like me. They won't vote for me. It's fine. I'm not concerned. The workers know I respect them. They know I like unions. I've said it more than once. They know I'm going to help them out. Right? The one union I talk about all the time is the corrections office. Anybody in corrections here? Anybody? No? Okay. Corrections offices often come because they have a big problem. The corrections offices, by the way, haven't had a contract in two and a half years. Two and a half years. They've been taking zeros for three years. Now, this is a union, and this is a Democrat, this is a Democrat governor, supposed to be pro-union. Right? Republicans are apathetic. They don't care about unions at all. And Democrats now have become hostile. So it's bad. It is bad. Am I right? Tell me I'm right, son. <laughs> he's not, not, he liked me before. Now he's got his food. He doesn't care about me anymore. I right, see how he is. Did I answer your question at least? Awesome. Great. Any other comment? Go, yes, go ahead. On the uh, question of uh, correctional officers unions, these might not be local to New York, but in California, the correctional officers unions are the worst offenders for financing longer sentencing, yes. laws, minimum sentencing drug laws. Yep. Like, I mean, on the one hand, you say you want to help the corrections officers yep. union. Are you going to do anything to stop their influence on further impinging on other people's liberties? I'll go back to what I just said before. Unions don't like me. The members do. I've told the members I have to make an actual change in criminal justice. And I'll go back to her original question about prison reform. The prison reform I talked about was the Humvee program, SEPs programs, all those, um, all those programs where you have community reform units. They require also corrections officers. Right? Here's what I know is in prison. I'm sure this is in prison. Number one, there are people in prison who really should be in prison and probably should never get out. And there are people in prison who made a mistake, should pay the debt to society, and when they're done paying the debt, should have a second chance at life like anybody else. And people in prison who probably shouldn't be in prison. My problem is, I don't know which one's which. I don't know. Who knows? The COs do. They deal with them every single day. They deal with them all the time. The, the solution to prison reform is not just beat up corrections officers unions. We're doing that now. It's not working. We have deaths in our prison system now all the time. Why? Because we have, we have a, a system, or she's an environment of apathy within the COs. They feel like no one cares about them, it doesn't matter. And they're right. The average, now I'll bring this up again, the average lifespan of a CO, a correction officer, is 58 years. Yes, people don't know that. 58 years. Not just that, on top of that, every single correction officer I've ever met knows someone who's committed suicide. Everyone knows someone who's committed suicide. They're getting <laughs> trashed in family courts. They have high divorce rates, and they all know someone who's an alcoholic. Every one of them. That's where they live in right now. And you wonder why it's so bad. A lot of that's our environment. We can fix their environment and make them part of the solution. 
They aren't the solution by, the, by themselves. They aren't. But they're part of it. How do I know this? If I go into a broken company that's trashed, totally trashed, what do I do? I don't go in and go, I'm firing everybody. No. I start saying, why is it broken? You're in the front line. What's going on? You're in the front line. What's going on? Tell me what's going on. He doesn't know. Okay, so he doesn't know. It's fine. But he knows. And you know, what's going on? And you make the local people part of the solution. You'd be surprised how often they jump out of apathy and they start trying to repair their own world. Corrections obviously no difference. Does that make sense? Will the union still want to have terrible sentencing? Probably. I don't care. They don't like me anyway. If I make life better for the average union worker, the unions will bend. Why? Because their workers will be happy. Note what I said. Happy New Yorkers. If I make happy corrections officers, the corrections officers union will shut up because their people like, we, he makes us happy. Stop bugging them. That's what will happen. Why? Because that's human nature. That's just how it works. Now, that might take a year. That might take three years. But it doesn't matter. Then California will be bad and we'll be good. And guess what will happen? Cool corrections officers from California will move to New York. Awesome. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Good. Go ahead. Uh, perhaps a very pointed technical question. I've been Uh-oh. going to brochures, and I've been going around now sticking them in people's doors. Thank you. Uh, Please, everyone should copy what he just said. Please do that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the doors that I've been sticking into are in, for houses that display the American flag, and in particular, anybody who's with a Marine flag. Yep. Do you think that's good? I love that idea. Yes, everyone copy that. Please, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, yes. Good. Yes, go ahead. Did you say shootings? shootings and businesses? Okay. What would you do to try to fix that problem? I don't know why people are shooting in business. Are these, dis bad. Are these disgruntled workers? Yeah they, yeah, they were angry because of the situation that they might have been fired. Or ah, yes, yes. Okay, this goes right back to my whole, whole point. <laughs> the, yes, the point here, again, is the same as the idea of the school shootings, right? Same concept. And the idea is people are unhappy. Why? There's no opportunities. Now I say this because, and some of you may not know this, my mother was a felon. My mother was a, was a drug addict and was a felon. And when she came out of prison, she had very limited opportunities. She was a felon. So I helped her to, to get herself back in action, to, to get back and get a job. And when she got a job, she felt like a hostage because she was afraid because if she got fired, there was no job for her, right? So what did I do? I took action. I started my, uh, my first business and I made her the boss because I didn't like my mom being a hostage. And if you're the boss, you can't get fired. So she ran the business. So that's what I did to fix it. But a lot of people don't have me, right? They don't have a guy like me. They have nobody. So they get fired or lose their job, they feel like they have nothing. There's no opportunity. And I'll say it again. All these public shootings, the vast majority, are actually public suicides. Right? Most of them. Yes. Again, what, what sane, normal, rational person does that? They don't. A person who is desperate and wants to commit suicide does that. Right? They go out and start doing that. That's what they do all the time. It happens. We have to make a better New York to where there's opportunity. To where my boss fires me, there's another job for me. It's a chance for me. There's something else I can do. Look, I'm a big proponent of second chances. I am. Why? My mom needed one. I needed one. Everyone in this room has failed. Everyone in this room has failed. We all fail. The issue is, do you have an actual chance as a second chance at life? I want you to have a second chance. So I'm about second chances. The way I fix that is twofold. One, making sure that I have better opportunities. And two, supporting businesses better so they don't have to fire people. <coughs> Those two things. Let me make things better. I want to fix the root, not the branch. The branch is, you know, put a guard at the door or something like that. Right? That's, that's the root. Put a guard at the door. That's a, that's a branch. Then it shoots the guard first. Right? Yes. Well, I'll, I'll do the same thing. I'll do the idea of school shootings, right? People talk about school shootings all the time, right? Same concept. You want to put a guard at the door? They'll shoot the guard first. It's not an answer. It's not an answer. We had a resource officer, uh, we were up in North Country, and she literally said, I know I'm a target. She's a resource officer at a school. She's like, I, don't, I hate my job, I know I'm a target. Why would you do that? They're gonna shoot her first. So, same idea. Fix the root, not the branch. Does that make sense? <coughs> Good. Okay, any other question or comment? Go ahead, please. I have uh, two separate ones I'll be brief. Good. Uh, the health care or pension fund. Okay, you tell me. Well, you, you tell me where you want to go. Do, I'll, I'll do both. Health care is at the top of my list. It's very bad. Health care it is. All right. I've had a traditional HMO for years. Uh, legislation changed, and the last one is health care and how it might cost more than triple. 
Yes. You pay twelve thousand dollars a year for five people. Yes, I'm saying, yeah. Oh, but your but your company pays another twenty five. Ah, so you're thirty. You're actually thirty four thousand. That makes more sense. Yes, thirty four thousand. Yes, yeah. Yep. Yep. No, I get it. It is. Look, I, I am my own company, so I pay all my own. Literally, if I think it was last year, I would have actually made more money, and I have a wife and two kids, if I had paid nothing and just paid everything out of pocket and paid the fine. I would have paid less. That's how expensive my health care is. It would, I would have paid less if I had paid the fine and just paid everything out of pocket. That's how bad it was. I completely agree. It's horrible. But here's the problem in this state, in the country. We have confused... We have confused health care and health care insurance. They are two completely separate things. Obamacare was not health care reform. It was health care insurance reform. What no one's reformed is the health care system. That's the actual problem, is the health care system. And the problem with the health care system is it's a cartel. Right? The only people in rooms right now who are saying, how much do you think for aspirin? Like, I don't know, 85 bucks, 90 bucks? What do you think? How much? 90? What do you think? What do you think? 95? 95. He's hired. You're fired. He's hired. $95. Exactly right. Yes. And 95 bucks. That's how they decide. If you've seen your bill, that's what it says. Aspirin, 95 bucks. Cup for aspirin, 25 bucks. Putting aspirin in the cup, 100 bucks. Finding the cup, 200 bucks. I mean, that's, yeah, you see it, right? That's what it does. That's someone deciding how much that costs, right? That's a cartel system. That has to be fixed at at the core. You've got to make it to where it's transparent, and it's not. Our current system is this. All right. Some of you may see, I did this before, I think, on Joe Rogan. All right. You, he gets a new job. He decides he's going to get a new job. And a new job, he has to get new clothes. So he comes to my clothing store, and he gets a bunch of new clothes, right? He gets a new jacket, shirt, whole deal. I go, great, perfect outfit. These new hat, these new hats, some new, sh- some new shoes and socks, new shoes, socks. Perfect. Oh, awesome. I love you. You look great. He goes, Larry, how much? I say, oh, I don't know. So I'm just going to take them? Yeah. Take them all. That's correct. Because it's perfect for you. Great. And you're going to get a bill in the mail in about two weeks. I don't know what the bill's going to be, but whatever it is, you have to pay or you're but in I trouble. trust that you're going to be reasonable. Yeah, that's the silly part. <laughs> yes. And that's how right now healthcare works. Right? They give you whatever. They say, good luck, go home, and you get a bill in the mail, and it's X thousand dollars, and you got to pay it. How is that okay? It shouldn't be, but in, in healthcare it is. First, go ahead. I can start about healthcare. I've been a union rep for years, and I've negotiated with a company for years ago. Years ago, we got a hospital bill, it was detailed. Yep. It was on, not today. And the, it, 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 we negotiated, if you follow a mistake on the bill, you mm-hmm. get half of it. Many times people found mistakes. They charge a man for women products, white sure. and stuff. And so they did away with all that. They did away. Now you don't get an itemized bill. If I go in the hospital for an appendix, appendix for operation, and I have all kinds of uh, pills I need to take, you go in, you take no pills, you're very healthy. You get the same bill. Mm-hmm. That's how it works for that. That's I believe it. There's I believe no, it. There's no... Well, you don't have to request it. It shows up with a bunch of CDC yeah. codes on it. And you got to call your health insurance yeah. company and try and decode the bill. Yes, that's correct. Why that's exactly, you've hit it perfectly. You want to fix health care? Here's the answer. One question, one word, one word only. Transparency. That's it. The answer is very simple. You make a rule. Within six months, eight months, nine months, whatever the rule is, three months, if you are in the medical field, you must follow exactly the same rules as any other service provider. Period. No special rules. Anything else. Must be transparent. Period. But Larry, well, how do we know? Well, when you, when you go to a, um, uh, get your car fixed, they check your car out, they pay, you pay up front for whatever that diagnostic is, and then they give you an estimate. Why can't you do the same with your health? Why can't you do the same with your health? Same idea. I've got an answer. They don't usually have to tell me what the procedures 
That's correct, which is why we will change that. And you, could you imagine someone says that? Well, I wanna, you want to buy a car. Well, I don't need to ever tell you what's in the car. Sorry. Could you imagine that? Yes. We will change that in New York State, and here's what I know will happen. There will be lawsuits and fighting and everything else, and, and I'm okay with that because it brings to the forefront to realize something. In every other medical world that is not essential, you have transparency, right? LASIK eye surgery, enhancements, dental, cos, uh, cosmetic dentistry, all those things. And what's happened in every single case? Every single case, prices go down, technology goes up, service goes up. In every, remember, and it, some of you old enough to remember, when they first came out with LASIK eye surgery, they used to charge per eye because it was so expensive. Anybody remember that? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was so expensive, they used to charge per eye because no one could afford both eyes. It was so expensive. Now, lots of people get it. Everything good has happened. It's happening already in many places, and it's already right now a two-tiered system. And now, I live in Queens. All the best doctors right now in Manhattan, none take insurance. None take insurance. None of them do. It's happening now. The better doctors don't take insurance. It's happening now. So they have systems, like you pay flat fee, or you have some type of uh, like a Costco model. Some, some people are doing that, right? Where you're all my, all my clients, me and him are doctors, where we have a doctor's office. You're all, my, you're all my clients. All of you pay a flat fee per month. 200 bucks a month, 500 bucks a month, whatever. A flat fee we'll agree upon. You can come to my, my, our clinic anytime you like. It costs five bucks. That's it. Anytime you like. You come, five bucks. They tried free. Didn't work. All the seniors came every day. <laughs> That's what happened. True story. That's what happened. The seniors all came every day. Because they're better to do. They're retired. They will show up at the, house, at, the, at the clinic every day because it's free. Charge five bucks. You can come as much as you want. What's our goal now as doctors? Keep you healthy so you never show up. Keep you healthy so you never show up. That's our goal. Keep you healthy so you never show up. That's our goal. Now, we stop making tons of money. What happens? We hire another doctor. You made a doctor for us? Yeah, he's in. So another doctor. Now you get all of us, same price. We buy an MRI machine and we put it in the basement. And now we hire a technician to do that too. How much is your MRI now? Five bucks. Because we own the MRI machine. It's five bucks. That's already happening. That system is beginning to happen already. That's the future. We have to make that happen and we have to facilitate that. That's important to do. Transparency is key. Once we change the healthcare system, all the pricing goes down, then we work on insurance. Then we work on it because now insurance becomes reasonable now because the pricing all went down. The cartel system goes away. All the